Rosella Marie Bjornsson was born on a farm near Champion, Alberta in 1947. Her father, flying as Aronka Champ, would keep an eye on crops, livestock, and even incursions of coyotes from high above, with a very young Rosella on his knee attempting to take over the controls. Raised by a flying family and ignoring her high school counselor sputtering, there are no jobs for women in aviation. Rosella got her private pilot's license at 17 after just two and a half months of training in Lethbridge. She intended to go all the way to airline pilot. She checked airline hiring policies and duly weighted her resume with a course of study at the University of Calgary. Meanwhile, she studied for her commercial license with Gina Jordan, who had become a lifelong friend. At the same time, Rosella was helping to organize the University of Calgary Flying Club, teaching and mentoring the first group of Girl Guide Air Rangers in Calgary, and starting the groundwork leading to an Alberta Flying Farmers Team chapter. Rosella got her commercial license in 1967 and her instructor's rating in 1969. To pay for the necessary flying hours needed for her ultimate goal, she moved to Winnipeg in 1970 to take up a job as an instructor at the Winnipeg Flying Club. There she accumulated 3,500 hours of flying and an air transport rating. In her spare time, she earned a class one multi-engine instrument rating. And while in Winnipeg, she was involved in organizing the Manitoba chapter of the 99s. Meanwhile, Rosella spoke with experienced airline pilots whenever possible, including the chief pilot of Transair. Her question, why can't a qualified woman do the job? When, after many applications to airlines across Canada, Transair interviewed her in 1973. She was armed with every qualification and she was known as a known quantity. Transair, Canada's fourth largest airline in 1973, hired Rosella as first officer on a Fokker F-28 Golden Jet. It was golden for Rosella, who became the first woman airline first officer in Canada and the first jet qualified female airline pilot in North America. She also became the first woman member of CALPA, the Canadian Airlines Pilot Association. When I was hired with Transair, um, I couldn't believe it, but I was the first woman in North America to be hired as a first officer, that means actually flying the aircraft, on a twin engine jet. It was, uh, it was great, but that's not the reason. I just wanted to fly. Give me a chance to fly one of those big airplanes and I'll be happy as can be. Well, Rosella got the chance to fly those big jets, but having mar married fellow pilot Bill Pratt in 1977, Rosella was later faced with a new challenge. In 1979, despite her strong protest, Transair grounded a pregnant Rosella. There was a lack of Transport Canada policy on this particular job issue. She returned to work one year later for Pacific Western Airlines, which had taken over Transair. After her second pregnancy in 1984, she worked with Transport Canada to help create a new policy for this vital issue. When she returned to work this time, she was flying for Canadian Airlines, which had taken over PWA. But new legislation had been created with Rosella's help stating that female pilots would henceforth be able to fly under a doctor's supervision for the first six months of pregnancy. This was a major milestone for women in aviation. While Rosella continued flying as a first officer, this poster was created in the late 80s for Alberta schools to inspire young women to look toward non-traditional jobs. It wound up on the walls of young women right across the province, some of whom later became part of the aviation industry. In 1988, Rosella was inducted into the International Forest of Friendship in, Can in Kansas, recognizing her leadership and furthering the activities of the 99s. But in 1990, it was the year that Rosella really made history. After years of competent and patient flying in the lineup with other career airline pilots, Canadian Airlines promoted Rosella to captain, making her the first female captain with a major commercial airline carrier in Canada. From 1990 till the year 2000, so that's 10 years, it was really great. By about the middle of the 1990s, Canadian Airlines formed a 
another, a sort of a subsidiary called Canadian North, and we were at the Canadian North base. So we did a lot of flying up northern Canada, like Yellowknife, Dornwell, Zanuvik, Cambridge Bay, Resolute Bay, Iqaluit. With Canadian Airlines, we had routes all over North America, and we were doing what I thought was great, but apparently, financially, we weren't doing so good. <laughs> And in the year 2000, Canadian Airlines announced that they were financially strapped and Air Canada bought Canadian Airlines. So there was another transition. I figure I've had uh, one interview and five hat badges. <laughs> Well, Air Canada formed Zip Airlines, a group of multicolored Boeing 737s set up for competition with WestJet, and Rosella's last tours were from the flight decks of Zip until her retirement in 2004. This flying lady did not want to go, but she felt it was time. In 2004, she was presented with the Calgary Aerospace Museum's Alberta Aviation Pioneer Award. And after her retirement, Rosella turned her considerable energies towards advancing the cause of women aviators and others who were part of aviation in Canada. Apart from many motivational speaking engagements, Rosella has spent many years as a volunteer and administrator for Canada's Aviation Hall of Fame, whose goal it is to memorialize heroes, leaders, and innovators in the field of Canadian aviation. Meanwhile, she established the Rosella Bjornsson Scholarship with the 99s to help aspiring women pilots in Manitoba pay for flight training. In 2014, the 99s honored her with a special commemorative postage stamp featuring her image, which was unveiled at the very hangar where Rosella had her very first flying lesson 50 years previously. And she remains highly involved in other aviation organizations to this day. Now, finally, here's a video clip from Rosella's 1997 induction into Canada's Aviation Hall of Fame. Every takeoff is a thrill, every landing is a challenge. I really love going to work. And I'm just like every other pilot. I want to fly bigger, faster, higher. So hopefully I can continue my career and uh, retire happily. And she did. Ladies and gentlemen, Rosella Bjornsson, a lady who from an early age knew she wanted to fly. And presenting her trophy is Marcia Strang, the 2013 LC Award winner in the business category. All the pilots said they had to look up to me. <laughs> I'm only five foot 12. <laughs> Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, honored guests. Everybody else has done this without a piece of paper, but I'm nervous. I'm very honored to be receiving the Elsie McGill Northern Lights Award. I have been following this awards presentations for the last eight years, and I am so proud of every single lady who has received an award. They are so deserving. I was so fortunate to have such a wonderful career. Like I said in the video, one job interview and five hat badges. I was merger qualified. <laughs> was quite a ride. It's amazing how a person forgets all the bad weather days, the early morning departures, 4 a.m. chickens, check rides, and simulator. I've forgotten all about it. I just remember the good times. I worked with so many great people, and I really missed the Boeing 737. That was my favorite airplane. Taking off out of Yellowknife, 40 below, climbing at 8,000 feet a minute. 
Mm, it was wonderful. What a way to go. But when I started with Trans Air, way back in 1973, I felt like the lonely female voice in the wilderness. The first time I landed in Toronto with the F-28, the ground control asked me if I had my seatbelt too tight. <laughs> Another time I landed in Calgary. The controller, ground controller, asked if they Transair now allowed flight attendants to use the radio. <laughs> I was kind of shocked. I didn't know what he's talking about. I'm a pilot. Hey, you know. So I had to explain to him that I was a pilot. I'd like to thank the organizers of the Northern Lights Award. They realize that women need to be recognized for their achievements, and there is a great need to inspire young women to a career in aviation. Even though we have made great progress, aviation is still a very difficult field to get into. It takes commitment, hard work, dedication, and perseverance. And these women, and every woman that has received an Elsie McGill Award has demonstrated these attributes in abundance. Next, I'd like to thank my nominators. They are my true friends. I'd like to thank my parents, who unfortunately are not with us anymore. They provided me with great opportunities. Can you imagine giving your keys to your 17-year-old daughter, keys to your aircraft, and telling your 17-year-old daughter, why don't you take your friends for a flight? Well, they did. I was so lucky to have their support and encouragement. I'd also like to thank my husband, Bill Pratt, is here this evening. Bill has had an interesting career as well. It's followed a parallel path to, me, to my own. We've shared many ups and downs. <laughs> <laughs> Together we have raised two wonderful children. Of course, they're adults now. Our son, Ken, is an aircraft maintenance engineer. He's a chief maintenance with uh, North Caribou out of the Edmonton International Airport. And our daughter, Valerie, is an occupational therapist. I've got three grandchildren. <laughs> I'm pretty happy about that. I have a 10-year-old grandson. I took him flying a couple weeks ago and, of course, let him handle the controls. He went to school the next day and told everybody he could fly. So uh, we, we have a good time together. When my husband and I were flying uh, with the airlines, we were both based in Edmonton, both on the 737. But I was captain, <laughs> and he was the first officer. <laughs> when it was his turn to make a PA, he would announce, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of my wife, the captain, <laughs> you can imagine that sort of caught people's attention. They would put the uh, newspaper down and look around and say, what did he say? <laughs> uh, there was one flight we were on to Fort McMurray. We opened the cockpit door and almost everyone on board came up to check up on us. And one fellow said, sort of leaned over and said to Bill, do you ever fight with her? <laughs> and we reassured him that we do not fight in the cockpit. Um, the neat thing about flying with the airlines, it's all standard operating procedures. So you really fly with anybody because you know what each other's 
duties are, and the captain has their duties, first officer has their duties. The neat thing about flying with my husband, I would be get to the point where I'd be asking for the gear down. He already had his hand on the gear waiting for my command. And uh, if I wanted flap, he already had his hand there. So we were sort of communicating without saying anything. So it was uh, a great, great life. And we've, we're still enjoying life. By next, uh, next June, we'll, have celebrate, we'll be celebrating our 40th anniversary. And lastly, I would like to thank each and every one of you who have come out, come out this evening to attend this gala event. Thank you for taking the time out of your busy schedule to support the Elsie McGill Northern Lights Award. It's so nice to see all of you here. Thank you.